Thank, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for taking time on this beautiful summer evening in early April to come and listen to a talk indoors. Um, I'd like to uh, talk to you, obviously, about the um, financial system and the situation that we find ourselves in today. And I think this, this, is a very, this is a very good day and a very good moment to have this conversation. Uh, I just came from Capitol Hill. Uh, from a, one of many briefings, I'm sure, that are going on right now, where people are grappling with the question of um, what legislation should be passed or not passed that will try and prevent a major financial meltdown from happening again. We, we faced in, in September uh, 2008, as you know, um, an enormous economic and financial calamity. And it seems only reasonable and, and completely consistent with the nature of American democracy, that, that, that we would fix this. I mean, that something bad happened. We can argue about the details. Again, that's very democratic of us. We have an administration that is packed with experienced professionals. We have a, a political process that has a good track, has had a good track record over 200 years of taking on and, and, and facing down major problems. So where are we on, on, on fixing the system that got us into so much trouble? Well, I would say, quite, quite honestly, quite bluntly, and, and, and hopefully we'll discuss this as we go through the evening, I, I'd say we're nowhere. I'd say we're at square zero. Okay? The legislation currently before Congress does not fix, in my view, the essence of the problem, the heart of the matter, in September 2008 and the months that followed, and in March 2009, when 13 bankers came to the White House to be saved. The essence of that problem is known as, and, and accurately known as, too big to fail. Those 13 banks and the bankers who represented them were saved unconditionally by the Obama administration. And when you, when you talk to senior people in the Obama administration, and, and I do talk to them, and, and I take them very seriously, and I, I don't know why, I don't know if they take me seriously, but they do talk to me. Um, they say they had to save those 13 bankers. They had to save the financial system. I agree with that, actually. They did have to save the financial system. Our economy cannot function without credit. I, th I think you, you all know that. But they, they insist that they had to save these 13 bankers, their jobs, their bonuses, their pensions, their perks, their boards of directors, their key staff, their empires, their attitude. They couldn't ruffle a feather on their backs. I, they don't say feather on their backs, but you get the general idea. They couldn't disturb a hair on their head without causing a deeper recession and increasing the probability of a major financial calamity. Now, I don't actually think that's true. And in the book, we go through in some detail why we think the, the government, this administration, had other options in March of last year. But just, just assume that it's true. Just assume for a moment that they're right. And that is an accurate statement of fact. Well, that's, that's extraordinary. That's incredibly dangerous. That means we have a small number of financial institutions, a small number of people, who essentially have the ability to extort money and various kinds of other support from the state. That, 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 that's, that's incredible. That, that's not without precedent, perhaps, in, in, in American history. We'll talk about some historical examples as we go through the evening. But that, that, that's, that's terrible. Right? If these banks are so big that you cannot allow them to fail, that, that is pretty scary. But if you must save them without disturbing anything about their incentives or their attitudes, you have an enormous problem. Let me tell you now one of my punchlines, one of the punchlines in the book, and, and one of the key points I, I was hammering, trying to hammer home on Capitol Hill just now. Our largest banks, the largest, let's say the largest six banks, actually, because I think it does come down a lot to these six banks. The largest six banks have a balance sheet, total assets, the size of the bank, which is 63% of GDP. Well, that, that's, that's pretty big. What were they before the crisis? 
2005, 2006, 2007, they, they were smaller. They were 56, 58 percent of GDP. What were they in 1995? Same banks and their predecessors. 17 percent of GDP. They're getting bigger. Of course they're getting bigger. They were bailed out. They were saved. They were allowed to buy other banks. They were encouraged to buy other banks. Their cost of funding today in the credit markets is estimated, I think accurately, to be between 75 and 80 basis points lower than for other banks. That's 0.75 to 0.8 percentage points. That's a big funding advantage. Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, one of, one of the more successful banks recently, said in a letter to his shareholders just this week that if we get big because we win, because we're good, we should be allowed to reach any size we want. That's the free market. Well, that's not the free market. We do not have a free market. We have a too big to fail unfair advantage. If you run a massive bank, and I'm just assuming that none of you do because they don't usually come and hear me talk, <laughs> but, but I'd be happy to have the debate if anyone is here from, from a massive bank. If you have a massive bank, you have a tremendous unfair advantage right now. You are too big to fail. You will be saved, and the credit market recognizes that. And of course you're going to get bigger. There is nothing in Jamie Dimon's job description as head of J.P. Morgan Chase that says he's responsible for American or global financial stability. I haven't seen his job description, but I'm, I'm confident in asserting that. His job description is to make money for his shareholders and for his colleagues at J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, we can discuss how well he does uh, for his shareholders, but certainly the insiders have done well. You've seen the latest compensation figures, I think. For 2009, total compensation on Wall Street was higher than it's ever been. Executive compensation was down a bit, but the compensation of people working in these banks was up. The CEO of Wells Fargo, John Stumpf, just got a, a big, uh, we've seen the details of a very big cash payout um, for 2009. Cash, which is exactly what the administration asked them not to do. In March 2009, President Obama did say to the banks, please be careful going forward, please behave yourselves, please don't take reckless risks, and we presume he said, please rein in the compensation, none of which they've done. John Stumpf uh, got paid a very big cash salary, which is exactly contrary to what the administration has asked for. The administration wants deferred compensation. When questioned about why he would get so much cash, a spokesperson for Wells Fargo said, well, we had a very good year in 2009. They did not have a good year in 2009. They were saved by the American taxpayer, by the, I think, excessive generosity, certainly generosity, of this administration. It's extraordinary, the attitude of these people. And, and nothing, nothing I say, nothing in the book is vindictive. Nothing is intended to get back at these people. This is just forward looking. Let's talk about the future. We can argue, actually, we can have an interesting argument about the extent to which the big banks perceive themselves to be too big to fail before September 2008. That, that's an interesting discussion. But that's not my focus, not the focus in the book. The question is now, do they think they're too big to fail? Goldman Sachs, a balance sheet fluctuates around $800 billion. If Goldman Sachs failed, if Goldman Sachs hit a rock, and I don't know if you, to the extent to which you follow this on a, on a daily basis, but uh, Greek bond spreads widen considerably today. Greece is in more trouble quicker than people were anticipating. Who knows what kind of exposure any of these big banks has, for example, through their um, derivatives off balance sheet uh, transactions. I'm not saying any one of them is in trouble, but let's imagine that, that Goldman Sachs, for example, hits a big rock today, tomorrow. Could they fail? Could they go bankrupt? No, absolutely not. They would be saved by the government. The, the consequences of Goldman Sachs failing would be far too, uh, perceived as far too traumatic and too dangerous. What about if the Dodd bill passes? What about if this legislation in the form currently proposed for discussion in the Senate, what if that passes or something very close to that? Would they let Goldman Sachs fail? Would it go into bankruptcy? No, no not in my assessment. We can discuss those details. And I am fully aware that this makes some of my friends on Capitol Hill quite upset when I say it. So 